In this lecture, we will discuss routing. Routing is basically an algorithm which says how a packet should move from a given source to a destination, right? Which path should it take? So why is this a big deal? Well, uh, it's a big deal for several reasons. So the first is that in our system, no flit is dropped. So that's important. So that is, you know, otherwise routing would not be maybe that big a deal, but given the fact that we are not allowed to drop any flit, we need to kind of maintain flow control at every link, which basically means that at every edge, we have credit based or on our flow control and uh, pretty much flits are not sent unless enough buffer space is available. Because of the first requirement, what happens? is that flits skew up in routers. As a result, there is congestion. To avoid congestion, we use virtual channels, which can solve the problem to some extent, but not to a large extent. So we still do have congestion. So it is necessary to search for alternative routes in the sense we go around this and so on and so forth, such that we can avoid congested areas and still route as many flits as possible, as quickly as possible from a source to a given destination. Kindly note that all the flits of a packet follow the same route, but all the packets of a message need not follow the same route. Again, in an NOC, typically we have packets only, but sometimes, you know, we have large message transfers as well. I mean, a multi-packet message transfers as well. And every packet has a head flit. So, the routing is basically done for the head flit. The rest of the body flits just follow the head flit and the tail flit is the last flit in the packet. So, the aim of routing is to send a message from a sender to a receiver via a path of intermediate routers. It is always good to have a choice of multiple routes. Uh, this is called path diversity. Why is path diversity important? Because higher is the path diversity, more is the congestion tolerance. So, what is a good route? Is it the shortest path or is it the shortest time? So, uh, ideally the shortest path may not be the shortest time because we could have congestion on the way. So, it should be the shortest time. But again, is it like we would have a distribution of times in the sense one packet may take a lot of time, one packet you know may take a lot of time, other one may take, may go very fast. So, what should the distribution be like? So, we can have many metrics over here. So, any good route would typically try to minimize the latency and also be fair in the sense it would try to reduce the span between the time that packets take, right, to as small a value as possible in a sense be fair and not to unnecessarily penalize other packets or basically to delay them. So, what are some of the problems we should avoid? So, we will discuss these problems in detail, but essentially any routing algorithm will avoid three problems, deadlocks, live locks and starvation. So, look at this, this is a typical street. So, basically here we have a gridlock kind of situation, right? Cars are trying to move uh, God knows where, in which direction, Th these guys are trying to go this way, they are coming to go this way. So, it is all kind of mixed up, right? Nobody can make any progress. So, this is with a city. So, here again, you know, you can't uh, take a helicopter and kind of airlift cars, right? So, that is not possible. So, basically what you do in this case is you somehow, you know, try to ease the congestion by seeing what is it that you can move or maybe force a few cars to take a longer route in the sense all of these cars could just be asked to exit this way, right? It does not matter wherever you are going. Right, uh, so maybe you know this car wants to go over here, but just make it exit this way, go somewhere else, and then again come back here, right, via a long route. So, all of that needs to be done because, like a real traffic network, we also cannot drop packets. So, as a result, to avoid congestion and to avoid such deadlock kind of situations, many long routes have to be taken. So, in our case, the meaning of a deadlock is like this, that no car can make any progress. So, if you see these four cars, 
and let's say we have only a single car in a space for only a single car in each block right right a block is like this point or this point then as we can see nobody can make any progress because this car is trying to go this way but there's a car over here this car can't move this can't move this can't move so there is clearly a circular weight situation of course one option would be that this car goes this way takes a long route and comes back and by that time this slot would have become empty but again uh, there is a need to actually realize that via a routing algorithm that would not allow such deadlocks to happen in the first place otherwise just solving them becomes quite difficult in an noc we can have exactly the same situation if we assume a buffer size of one flit then this is nothing but a deadlock situation so in this case we have flits in router a trying to go to router b then a flit over here trying to go to C, but C has no space. C trying to go to D and D to A. So let's now look at other problems uh, along with deadlock, so which is live lock and starvation. So live lock basically is that flits continuously get transmitted, quite unlike a deadlock where continuous movement is happening. But the fact is that they're never reaching their destination. So in a certain sense, if this is the destination, this is the source, so if flit goes and it just kind of goes around and around and around in circles, so it basically never reaches the destination. So in this case, quite unlike deadlocks, movement is happening, progress is happening, but it's not meaningful progress. So the flits are not reaching the destination. As a result, there is this infinite looping and these routing algorithms in a sense never terminate. So this is a live lock which is clearly not acceptable. And starvation is that a certain flit never makes progress in the sense is just stuck in a router. It never moves towards its destination. This in other words would essentially mean that it has the lowest priority. Its router always ignores it and in its place transmits other flits, right? So it continually does that. It transmits other flits, right? And uh, it does not transmit this. So we have a famous result in computer science which is reasonably straightforward and common sense also that let us say we have starvation freedom. The starvation freedom basically means that it is never the case that a certain flit will never make progress. Then this would Assuming that there are no live locks, this would imply deadlock freedom. Right? So, starvation freedom would imply deadlock freedom because starvation freedom says that no packet is ever stuck. And given the fact that we are seeing that there are no live locks, this means if it is not stuck, means what? It is moving. Right? So, you never have it will reach its destination. Furthermore, if a packet is never stuck, it also means another thing which is that it always has the flexibility to move. As a result, there is no deadlock because a deadlock means that till infinite time, indefinite time, none of your flits that are involved in this circular weight kind of situation, none of them can move. But given the fact that moving is guaranteed because you have starvation freedom, it would imply deadlock freedom. But mind you, the converse is not true in the sense that if there is deadlock freedom, it does not mean that there is starvation freedom. And what is a good way of proving it? Well, we can just, you know, prove it using a counter example. So, we can basically say, look, all that I can do, I mean, in this case, actually with an example. So, I can say that, look, what I can do is that I can take a flit in a router and I can delay it forever. So, there is a router over here with its queues. I can just take one of these flits, put it in like an auxiliary queue and kind of keep it over there, delay it forever. So in this case, that flit is suffering from starvation, no doubt. But you know, I'm, the rest of my algorithm could be designed in such a way that there are no deadlocks and we will find a lot of examples of such algorithms discussed in this chapter, which are provably deadlock free. So, in this case, deadlock freedom does not guarantee starvation freedom, 
But mind you, the other way, which is that if there is no starvation freedom, there are no deadlocks, always holds true. So now the question is that how do we solve this issue of starvation and live lock? Well, both the problems can be solved by implementing a version of aging, which basically says that the longer a fleet stays in a router, right, you kind of jack up its priority. Jacking up its priority essentially means that instead of taking other routes to avoid congestion, it takes a straight route, right? So, so let's say, you know, it's going, but at this point you decide that there is congestion and then, you know, it waits and then its priority gets hiked up. It kind of takes a straight route, you know, as straight as it can, the shortest path to the destination. That prevents live locks and furthermore, given that its priority is high because it has waited for so long, it would prevent starvation as well, right? So, in that sense, aging is a generic solution. But again, aging is something that is hard to implement. In practice, aging is hard to implement. In, in fact, in practice, even starvation freedom is hard to implement. Because if you think about it philosophically, starvation freedom or starvation rather is an attribute of a single node, right? So, this is kind of a local property. In a sense, you are saying that this is local to the router. But, you know, in deadlocks, what happens? If you take a look at this case, this is more like, you know, not local, it's kind of global or let's say more than local. So, in this case, the network's configuration is such that the fleet buffers are full and the fleets are not able to move. As a result, we are seeing a deadlock. So, a deadlock is more of a global thing and starvation is local. And even if you don't want starvation, you still have to guarantee that another router who is your neighbor has sufficient space available. And that is often very hard to do. So, that's why achieving starvation freedom in practice is hard. Or let's say guaranteeing starvation freedom by only making local decisions is hard. That is why most papers kind of guarantee deadlock freedom, starvation freedom and live lock separately. Right? So, they don't take the starvation freedom route and uh, they basically kind of divide these into multiple subclasses and sort of look at them differently. Now, the question is how do you deal with deadlocks? So, as I, so as I said, live locks and some aspects of starvation can be taken care of by aging. And mind you, aging is also kind of a local property in the sense it's local to the router. The longer you are there, the more you age. So, the router kind of chooses you over others, if at all it can send. So, let's say we have a deadlock avoidance protocol or a protocol which just prevents deadlocks, right? stops them from happening. Then in this case, what we can do is that we can say that, look, you will always have someone to send your packet to. And so that will take care of red locks. And for starvation and live locks, you just implement aging, which is a local solution. In the sense, internally, you have a priority system, which does not allow a flit or a packet to stay in your router indefinitely. So the more senior it gets, the more aged it becomes kind of keep on increasing its priority until, you know, you can say that, you know, by this time, the fleet would have definitely been sent. So, dealing with deadlock, so we will be looking at this diagram several times. So, it's important we understand this diagram. So, in this case, we have packet P1, which is trying to go from D to B. It is stuck at A because D to A it has traversed, but A to B it has not traversed. It's not able to go because of packet 2, which has to go from A to C. One link it has traversed, so in a sense, it's kind of stuck because it's not able to go to C. Similarly, packet 3 is going to go from B to D and packet 4 is going to go from C to A. So, we say that, uh, let's say packet P1, for instance, which is this packet, is holding channel 1. Holding channel 1 basically means its flits are in its flits are in the buffers of channel 1. That's what in this case uh, holding would mean that its flits are in the buffers of channel 1. And in a sense, uh, it's holding it, it's trying to hold channel 2 in the sense it's trying to look for buffer space that is associated with channel 2. But it's not able to hold it, hence it just wants to hold this channel. 
and why is it wanting well the reason being that p2 which is supposed to go from a to c is actually physically resident over here and it is not able to move forward because c does not have free buffers because p3 is holding on to it so what are you essentially doing you are essentially saying that i am a packet i am holding on to a channel with the definition that i just mentioned and i want to hold on to another channel right uh, such that my flits can move from in this case from channel 1 to channel 2 and in this case since nobody is able to move you are clearly seeing a deadlock situation so we will now introduce the resource dependence graph the rdg where basically it's a bipartite graph we have packets on one side and we have channels on the other side so basically we say that these are packets and we have channels. So, then there is an arrow from let us say packet p i to channel j like this. If the packet p i is waiting for it to be free or it, if it wants channel 2, uh, right, if p 1 wants, sorry, if p 1 wants channel 2, there is an arrow. Similarly, if p 1 is holding a channel, then there is an arrow from 1 to p 1. So, there is an arrow from channel from channel j to packet p i then if the packet p i this basically means that packet p i holds the right to transmit on channel j right. So, basically in this case it is p 1 is holding channel 1 it wants to hold channel 2, p 2 is holding channel 2 it wants to hold channel 3. Similarly for p 3 and p 4 right very interesting it is holding channel 4 it wants to hold channel 1. So, as you can see there is a nice cycle in this directed graph right so there is a cycle and a cycle essentially means a circular weight and a circular weight essentially means that this is a deadlock situation because i have something but i want something from my neighbor my neighbor has what i want but it wants something from its neighbor and its neighbor is not able to give it for the same reason so on and so forth we form a cycle hence none of us can make any progress Right, So, this cyclic weight situation is a deadlock and a theoretical tool, a mathematical tool to basically characterize a deadlock is the resource dependence graph which is drawn in this way, which is that if you hold a channel then there is an arrow from the channel to you and if a packet wants a channel there is an arrow from the packet to the channel it desires to hold. If there is a cyclic weight we are gone because there is a deadlock. Right. So, let us now extend this concept to a channel dependence graph or a CDG, which if you think about it is a modified version of the resource dependence graph. So, if I come back to the graph over here, then what you would see is that there is an arrow from channel 1 to packet P1, then one arrow from P1 to channel 2 and the definitions of these arrows I was just explaining a couple of minutes ago that uh, you know if there is a from arrow from a channel to a packet then it means that this packet kind of owns this channel and if there is an arrow from a packet to a channel it means the packet is desirous of getting access to this channel. So, now if we think about it we can remove the packets from the picture and instead directly add an edge between the channels. For example, if you see there is a path from channel 1 to channel 2 of course via packet p1 but <coughs> having packet p1 over there is this is kind of incidental in the sense it's not adding a great amount of value so i can instead have a graph where this is not there but i have a direct edge from 1 to 2 same way the direct edge from 2 to 3 3 to 4 and then from 4 to 1 this is exactly what i have over here that I have removed the packets. I have just considered the dependencies between channels which is 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1 and so on. So, uh, what would be kind of common sense over here is that we if we have a cycle in the channel dependence graph right. So, so, so let us look at this particular case it would imply a deadlock which basically means that you know there is a circular weight in the sense that uh, 
1 is waiting on 2, 2 on 3, 3 on 4 and 4 on 1. So, this is like a circular weight kind of situation. And any kind of a circular weight kind of situation is a deadlock. So, in the CDG, we need to avoid these cycles. So, the sad part is that we could have deadlocks even with virtual channels. So, let us do one thing. So, in this case, let us slightly change the connotation of the channel dependence graph. So, let us call it the virtual channel dependence graph, right? So, basically, every channel is a virtual channel. So, in this case, what will happen is that uh, we can say that look, every physical channel is associated with two VCs. Let us further number these VCs. 0 and 1. So, we can say that uh, for all the 0 numbered virtual channels, we have a deadlock situation over here and for all the 1 numbered virtual channels, we have a deadlock situation over here. So, basically as you can see, even with virtual channels, right, assuming we slightly change the connotation of the channel dependence graph to a virtual channel dependence graph. So, what we have basically over here is that even with virtual channels, we have deadlocks. Uh, as you can see over here, that uh, deadlocks are indeed possible as you can see here, that uh, the virtual channels are kind of, so of course, you know, you have multiple two VCs per physical channel, but still we have dead, a deadlock situation that is here. So, having virtual channels does not prevent deadlocks, even though we will see that there is a protocol which can make a VC design kind of deadlock immune, but we will take a look at it. So, now let us come to the, to a new concept turn graphs which we are uh, introducing over here. So, let us first see what is the need for introducing a turn graph or a TG when we already have CDGs and RDGs defined. So, their disadvantages are like this that uh, look if you draw uh, the topology of the network, right, and a certain channel will be oriented this way, someone oriented this way. So, there is the orientation information, which way are you going? So, we can have our, you know, we can have directions like this. We can say that they are like north, south, east and west. So, this north, south, east, west information of channels is kind of getting lost and this is what we are referring to as orientation and we do not want to lose this information, right. So, the basic steps are like this. Let us consider a path C in the channel graph, in the channel dependence graph. So, basically a path C, you know, could be any path. It could be, let us say, this path here or it could be the entire cycle. It does not matter. They consider a path. So, the turn graph will contain all the nodes and the channels that belong to C. So, C basically contains what? It contains a set of channels, right? So, the turn graph, would, uh, the nodes of the turn graph will be all the nodes and the channels. So, the moment you consider channels automatically, you are considering nodes. So, everything that belongs to C will belong to the turn graph, but with an additional rider that it will preserve the orientation of the channels and it will not contain any other channel. So, I will explain this with an example or maybe I should go to the example here on the next slide. So, let this be the original graph. So, well, so this is a computer science term graph where we have the original NOC network on chip and we have four nodes A, B, C and D and as you can see, we have a bunch of channels that connect to them. So, uh, the channel, uh, a channel dependence graph can be formed after, of course, we have formed our channels. So, let us look at four channels here, 1, 2, 3 and 4. 1 connects A to B, 2 B to C, 3 C to D and 4 uh, D to A. So, what I can do is that I can create a channel dependence graph of the form 1, 2, 3, 4, right, assuming that there is a deadlock situation. But this is its CD. So, here is the fun part that I will consider, you know, these four channels in the CDG and create a turn graph out of them. So, to do that, what I will do is I will extract the node information from the original graph. 
I'll extract the channel information from the CDG. Then what I will do is that I will have the nodes as they are. I will have the channels as they are, preserve their orientation. So as you can see, I've extracted the nodes from here, I've extracted the channels from here and the path is clearly visible. And the orientation is the same in the sense, you know, channel 1 is going from west to east, it is going from west to east over here. And I have something additional, we insert a new node called the channel node in the middle of each edge or channel, right? So, in the middle of each edge or channel, so let's say this is channel 1, uh, to kind of delineate that, I add a new node called the channel node and I have 1 here, 2 here, 3 here and 4 over here. So, if there is a path C in the CDG, there will be a path having the same channel nodes in the TG. So, that is clear. So, the reason is that if I have a path in the CDG with channel nodes 1, 2, 3 and 4, then I will have a path in the TG with exactly the same channel nodes 1, 2, 3 and 4 and of course, they are uh, you know the regular nodes at the ends of each channel. So, the most important result uh, here in this slide is that if there is a cycle in the TG, CDG, then the same cycle will be visible in the TG also if we extract if the cycle is a part of this path C, right? If the cycle in the CDG, it is possible to construct a TG that exhibits a cycle. So, coming back to this, as you can see, there is a cycle in the CDG. So, we were able to construct a turn graph with a cycle with the channel nodes over here and we preserve the orientation of the channel as per the original graph. So, the turn graph is in many ways kind of capturing the information of the orientation, capturing the information of the nodes and the channels and it is taking a particular path in the CDG and of course, we are interested primarily in those paths which contain cycles. So, what are the properties of the TG? So, again, this is all simple stuff, but it is kind of necessary to enumerate that uh, every edge in the CDG Right, so edge in a CDG means what? It is basically a link from channel 1 to 2, would translate to either a set of collinear nodes in the TG in the sense, you know, if this is from A to B and that is from B to C, it could be collinear in the sense it could be A to B and B to C or you could have a turn, you could go to A to B and then you could turn and then go to C. So, either it would be collinear or it would imply a turn. Furthermore, every cycle in the CDG will also be a cycle in the TG. In the sense, we can create a TG that exhibits the cycle. And furthermore, every cycle in the CDG, which is equivalent to a cycle in the TG, it can be translated to a sequence of straight paths and turns. So, as I said, because every edge in the CDG is either a set of three collinear nodes or a turn, it is a sequence of either straight paths or turns in the corresponding turn graph. So, what is our aim? Our aim is to ensure that there are no cycles in the turn graph. If there are no cycles in the turn graph, basically what happens is it is not possible to create a turn graph with cycles. That is a more accurate way of putting it. It means that, you know, all CDGs will have no cycles, which means there will be no deadlocks. So, if a routing protocol is having these in a cycle free TGs and CDGs, then uh, the routing protocol is provably deadlock free, right? So, essentially what you will have to do is that you will have to create a protocol such that it is not possible to create a turn graph with a cycle. If it is possible to do so, which is to create a, protoc a protocol in which all possible turn graphs are cycle free, then we have a deadlock free routing protocol. So, let us start looking at some of the simplest routing protocols, we will gradually kind of jack up the complexity. So, we are starting with the simplest routing protocol, which is simple yet very inefficient, but anyway, we will start with the simplest. So, what we do is that we take a mesh of nodes, so every node is a router and then we give every node an x coordinate and a y coordinate. So, let us say if you are node A, we will give it the coordinates x1 and y1. Similarly, if you have node B, we will give it the coordinates x2 and y2. 
So, we will route along the x axis first. So, we will keep the y coordinate the same and we will change x1 to x2. So, we will move from x1 y1 to x2 y1 and uh, then what we will do is we will keep x2 the same and we will route along the y axis. So, we will change from y1 to y2. So, we will go along the x axis first then go along the y axis. All right. So, basically this is from x1 y1 to x2 y1 and then x2 y1 to x2 y2. So, this is dimension ordered routing or xy routing well why? Uh, the main reason being that first we go along the x axis and then we go along the y axis. So, similarly if we have n dimensions in the sense if we have a cube or something we can order them. Uh, you know, we can go along dimension 1 first, then along dimension 2 first, then along dimension 3, so on and so forth. So, basically if you have dimension 1, 2 and 3, we go along one dimension, then the next and then the next, uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, if you have n dimensions, of course, we order the dimensions and then we go along them. So, this is of course, a simple technique as you can see right. But the point is that this has absolutely no path diversity because given the starting point and the end point, the path is fixed. So, what we can do is that let us assume that the turn graph has a cycle, right. So, let us try to prove by contradiction. Let us assume that with this protocol, I am able to create a turn graph that has a cycle, right. So, that is kind of the boon or bane of my contention, right, uh, that uh, we will have. So, of course, many cycles are possible, but I can, you know, kind of break them down in either into a simple clockwise cycle or an anti-clockwise cycle. So, let us look at an anti-clockwise cycle. The proof for a clockwise cycle is similar. But again, you know, if I kind of break it down into a simple shape, I will either have a clockwise or an anti-clockwise cycle. So, in an anti-clockwise cycle, uh, let us see what will happen. So, what will happen is that we will have, so this is an anti-clockwise cycle in a turn graph, right. So, the in the turn graph, let us focus on this turn. So, this turn is the one that is the most important. It is the CK, uh, the CKth channel to the CK plus 1th channel turn. This turn is technically not allowed in the XY routing protocol because a packet is traversing in the Y direction first and then it is moving along the X direction, right. So, if you go, uh, go along the Y direction first and then you go along the X direction which is not allowed because it is XY routing, it is not YX routing, right. So, first go along Y and then along X is not allowed. Which basically means that if this turn is not allowed, we cannot construct a TG with an anti-clockwise cycle. Similarly, we cannot construct a TG with a clockwise cycle. Hence, for all cases, we cannot construct a TG with a cycle since, a T, since you know, all possible TGs will not have cycles, we will not have any deadlocks. This basically proves that any XY routing protocol is provably deadlock free. Well, why? The reason is quite simple. The reason is basically that we will not have deadlocks because we cannot create a TG with a cycle either clockwise or anti-clockwise because one of the turns will be precluded, right. So, even in a clockwise cycle, so actually the arrows will be reversed, right. Uh, so, all the arrows if you go by the red ones, they will be reversed. So, here again here again, you know, this turn is the one that will not be allowed in a clockwise case because we are going, going around, uh, go, sorry, going along y first and then along x, which is not allowed, right. So, what are the problems with x, y routing? Well, first, the good thing is it is simple, but the bad thing is there is no path diversity, the route is fixed. The algorithm cannot adapt to any kind or any form of congestion, right. So, be, be, because it cannot adapt or to any form of congestion, there is a problem. 
So, now uh, let us look at what is called oblivious routing the valiance algorithm. So, what we do is we choose a point P at random, we send the message from the source to P and then from P to the destination which is B. So, the idea is that since there are so many choices for P, we can send a message to P and then from P to B. So, in this case we are dealing with congestion much better because the point P can really be at random. So, there is a lot of path diversity and furthermore we are using the basic XY routing protocol to go from A to P and to go from P to B. So, that is what we are doing the basic protocol is being used. So, in this case th this algorithm is also provably deadlock free because for each leg of the journey XY routing is being used. But the routes are long and suboptimal because even to go from A to B or let us say if A was here and B was here and let us say P was over here, we would have to take a long, long detour. <coughs> so, the key point over here is that the routes can be, uh, sorry, uh, in the detour I go along X first and then along Y, but you get the point, right? So, that it will be a long path. So, to avoid that, we we kind of, you know, tie the hands of valiance oblivious routing and we have minimally oblivious routing. In this case, we create a window around B. So, we send the message from the source and we choose the point P in this small window only. So, this reduces the extra work, the extra effort, still provides us with a degree of randomness and path diversity. So, we send the message from the source to P, any which is any node within the window and then we send a, a message from P to the destination which is B. So, the computed routes in this case are not very long because we have constrained the choice of P. So, we could on the other hand also have a window around A and have the nodes node P along A and then from P to B, it will not make a you know, big difference. But the key point is that the computer routes are not very long. We have reduced the amount of path diversity, but still there is some. So, this is like a trade off. It is like a trade off between pure XY routing and between pure oblivious routing, right? It is kind of a trade off between them. So, it is somewhere in the middle. So, now we will look at adaptive routing, which takes uh, kind of uh, jacks up the game one level further, where we have a fair amount of path diversity and we also do not have very long routes. So, here what we do is first we label the directions north, south, east and west. So, now if we consider uh, the two possible turns that we ha can have, simple turns, say any <coughs> you know big path in a turn graph can pretty much be reduced and uh, to these two simple cycles if at all there is a cycle. This is a clockwise cycle and this is an anti-clockwise cycle. So, in the clockwise cycle uh, the turns that we will have other than collinear paths is basically north to east, east to south, south to west and west to north. And similarly, the anti-clockwise paths will be north to west, west to south, south to east and east to north. So, if you think about it, each cycle essentially consists of four turns for each. Out of these four turns, we can allow only six turns at the most in the sense that one of these turns we can get rid of here, one of these turns we can get rid of here. So, if we do that, then uh, what you can see very easily is that none of these cycles will complete. A clockwise cycle will not complete and an anti-clockwise cycle will also not complete because we have gotten rid of one of the turns, right? So, how many ways are there of getting rid of turns? We have four ways of getting rid of turns here, four ways of getting rid of turns here. So, we have four cross four or 16 ways of getting rid of turns. So, the idea is that we are allowing 6 turns, right? And because 1 we are getting rid of, so 3 are left, 1 we are getting rid of, 3 are left, we are allowing 6 turns. 
So we have to remove one turn from each cycle to prevent a cycle from forming in the turn graph. And if you see in the case of XY routing, we were actually allowing four turns. One of them was this way, one of them was this way, one was this way and one was this way. So only four turns were being allowed. In this case, we are allowing more turns. So more are the turns, more is the flexibility that we are allowing. Right, so from 4 we have gone up to 6, we can't have more, otherwise we will be then be kind of creating a cycle. So this is known as the theory of turns and this any method of routing which essentially uses 6 available turns and essentially does not take 2 turns, this is known as adaptive routing, right. So the packets do not turn in certain directions and this guarantees that it is deadlock free. Why is it deadlock free? Because the cycle will not form in any TG and why will the cycle not form? Because we can reduce all complex paths with cycles to two simple cycles clockwise or anticlockwise. Each one of them will have four turns and we remove one each, then we can't have a clockwise cycle, neither an anticlockwise cycle. So the types of routing algorithms based on turns, so we have already discussed XY routing, we have four turns allowed here and here we get rid of one each let us say. So we have four choices, four cross four, 16 combinations. So we can have 16 such adaptive routing algorithms that eliminate one turn from each cycle. And uh, we can then, uh, you know, sh create many routing algorithms as I said 16. Three of them are quite popular, they are known as West first, North last and negative first. So let us look at uh, one of them, let us look at all of them one by one. So in West first, what we do is that we disallow two turns where West comes at the end, this is one turn. This is one more turn, so both of these are disallowed because West is coming at the end and the name of our algorithm is West first. So we have north to west and south to west and the allowed turns will basically be these but we have not allowed this term which is going south and going west and we have not allowed this turn which is going north and going west so both of these are not allowed. Similarly, we could have north last so then this is the reverse of this first has become last. So the two turns that we will not allow is the ones in which north comes first which is north to west and north to east. So these two which is north to east and north to west are not allowed. And finally we have negative first in the sense that if you are going from north to west, so you can think of west as a negative direction and similarly east to south, you can also look at that as the negative direction. So these two turns we will not allow, right, if anything is going in a negative direction comes at first. So you get the pattern, so what we are doing is that for one cycle we are allowing 3, for the other cycle we are allowing 3 and we are having 6 available turns, this is giving us a high path diversity and a reasonably high congestion avoidance capability in the sense that this is way way more flexible than basic XY routing. So given the fact that we have discussed adaptive routing. Let us now look at cases which use virtual channels. So, in fact, you know, one of the early uses of virtual channels was actually deadlock avoidance, but later on, you know, that kind of become a, became a secondary use case. But let us look at a very old algorithm which used virtual channels to basically ensure that there are no deadlocks. So, here again, what we are doing is we are assuming a simple graph as we did earlier with two VCs per physical channel. And uh, we number the VCs 0 and 1, so the packet is injected into VC0 all the time. It keeps traveling in VCs numbered 0 until it crosses an imaginary line called the date line. So what I do is I draw an imaginary line in the middle of this channel, call it the date line. The moment, you know, flits of a packet cross this, the head flit of the packet crosses this, it will shift to VCs labeled 1 and henceforth it will only continue in VCs labeled 1 till it reaches its destination. It will never go back to VCs labeled 0. So what are we doing? We are essentially introducing some sort of an asymmetry, right, 
that is being introduced and asymmetry is being introduced where you start in VC is numbered 0, wait till you cross the red line, henceforth you move to VC is labeled 1. So, the claim is that this is provably deadlock free, there will be no deadlocks and it is not very hard to prove that and the reason or the basic, the crux of the proof will again be asymmetry. So, consider a flit on a VC numbered 1, it is never going to wait for any VC which is numbered 0 because as I said once it can crosses the date line, it in a sense is promoted. So, it will only look at you know higher aspects of life which is basically VCs numbered uh, 1 and if there are you know multiple numbers 1 and more right, but it will never look at a lower number in this case is 0. As a result, a cyclic wait is not possible because 0 numbered VCs will wait on 1 numbered VCs, but not vice versa. So, cyclic wait is not possible, thus a cycle is not possible, hence you get the pattern, deadlocks are not possible. So, we have discussed a fair amount of routing. So, let us now, we still have some time left in this lecture. So, we will uh, look at the basics of a router. So, a router basically looks like this, that let us first you know consider four directions north, south, east, west. So, a router will get inputs, so it is it is a physical router if it is not at the rim or periphery, it will be connected to four other routers in all four directions north, south, east and west. And also it will have this additional connection from the local tile, where recall that a tile is basically a group of cores and cache banks that send their data to the local router. So, the router will take data from its local tile. So, these will be its 5 inputs and the 5 outputs again will be the physical channels in the north, south, east, west directions and again an output to its local tile. So, broadly speaking, a router has 5 inputs and it has 5 outputs. So, if you now if you think about it, how do you design a router? Well, uh, interesting question. So, basically we will ha always have a single physical channel, but the single physical channel, it, the channel itself may logically be divided into multiple virtual channels. So, of course, if you have a single virtual channel, we could have a single you know buffer q q of flits, but if you have two VCs, we basically need to create two logical channels, two queues, one q per VC that buffers all the flits. And uh, the point is in a router, you know, even before you process a flit, it needs to be buffered, it needs to be stored. So, all the flits need to be buffered first. So, here again we have multiple options if you have multiple VCs right for a single physical channel. One is that you know if you have k VCs, we have k of these you know buffer queues, flit buffer queues. The negative aspect of this design is that these have, these will have a small size. So, let us say these are 8 entries each, then it means that if there are 12 flits, we will not be able to pack all 12 over here uh, right. So, 4 will still be there with the sender. Instead, we could have one large set of buffers and kind of split it into different individual buffer queues. So, we could have VC0. So, this for example could be the head of the queue, this could be the tail of the queue, head of the queue, the tail of the queue, so on and so forth. And uh, basically, you can see the flexibility over here that when you would add a new flit, you will add it to the tail of the queue. And basically, here you could remove something basically that would be tantamount to the head advancing over here, right, uh, right, because all we, you always remove from the head and you add to the tail of the queue. So, the head would basically move in this direction, tail will also move in this direction. So, what can be done is that you can have a large circular queue of buffers and that could be logically split into different sub queues where of course, these individual you know sub queues or queues per VC would be non overlapping. That could in principle be done where there is no overlap between them and the advantage of this design clearly would be the flexibility. 
there would be a tremendous amount of flexibility over here and this design would be quite flexible and the reason for that would basically be that you know some of these uh, th that you know th there is a large number of buffers and one queue can grow at the expense of others and you are assuming that not all the plate buffer queues would kind of be at that maximum occupancy all the time. So, if one of them is disproportionately large we can accommodate. So, then uh, the first stage was of course, buffer right this is the second stage. So, we will actually we are in the process of creating a router pipeline. So, in this case what we are basically doing is that we are creating a pipeline of stages where we are saying that first you buffer the flits, the next thing is you compute the route. So, let us say that I am over here and I need to go to the destination which is over here. I need to figure out what is the next node on the path that I should send the packet to and the route computation is only done for the head flit of the packet. There is no reason to do it for the rest because the rest of the flits in the packet would follow the same route. So, we will have a head flit, then we will have a bunch of body flits and then we will have a tail flit. So, what we do is that we compute the route for the head flit, the rest of the body flits and the tail flit kind of follow the head flit and they take the same route. So, what we need to do is the moment we see the head, we need to find out its destination. So, in fact, the critical path of the entire router computation actually contains, actually is for the head flit. The rest kind of follow the head flit, but the critical path is only for the head flit over here. Uh, so, for the purpose of routing, we use a routing table. So, let us consider this node over here, node 5. So, node 5 as you can see has 4 neighbors and of course, the other neighbor would be its local tile. So, node 5 in this case would maintain a routing table which basically says that given the destination which are all the other destinations, where do I send the flit or packet to? I specify the next hop for the final destination. So, given a final destination, I specify the next hop. This is as per the routing protocol or as per the routing policy of the of the node. So, this table here shows the routing decisions for the north last algorithm. So, if you see the north last algorithm, we will not have any turn where north is coming first in the sense these two turns north to east and north to west are the turns which will be precluded. And we are doing this for node 5. So, note that in some cases we may have a choice of multiple routes. But again that is good because if we have a choice of multiple routes, we will have some idea of the congestion information. So, where do we get congestion information from? <clears throat> so, this can be uh, gotten from the uh, from the credit based uh, information or from the way that uh, the rate at which buffers are clearing. So, go back to our discussion on flow control. So, on flow control uh, that part right, we did discuss the idea of credits. So, uh, from a credit based, uh, so, so, so this credit based information, this is what can give us the rate at which our buffers are clearing up and or the number of credits that I have for different directions. So, that will kind of tell you which direction is kind of more congested. So, we take that into, ac into account. And we also see the last time the channel was used, right, a particular channel was used, how long did it take and uh, basically what was the delay, was I able to send all the flits for the packet together or was there a delay. On the basis of that, I do my computation. So, this is the routing table over here. So, let us understand the logic behind creating this particular routing table. So, in this case, let us say from 5, my destination is 1. So, as I said, the north to west turn is what I will avoid. So, I will go west. I go west. I want to go to 2. The answer is simple. I go north. I want to go to 3. Again, the north to east turn is something I have avoided. So, I will go east. I need to go to 4. Well, the answer is simple. I just go west. I need to go to 6. The answer is simple. I go to east. I need to go to 7. So, in this case, 
I can either go east and then south or uh, I can sorry I can go west and then south or I can go south and then west it doesn't matter both the turns for me are allowed. So, here I have an option of two turns south or west. I need to go to 8 again it's straightforward I go south and I go to uh, need to go to 9. So, this is quite similar to 7 I have an option of two routes south or east. So, as you can see in many cases it's a small network. So, basically in many cases there is no path diversity because I do not need it, but wherever you know I need to make a diagonal crossing uh, I either do not have path diversity because a turn is precluded or I do have path diversity in the case of 7 and 9. So, I will have similar routing tables you know for every destination where do I need to go at every node and this is kind of hardwired because my routing protocol as such is hardwired and mind you this is provably deadlock free. So, the router pipeline up till now well we have discussed buffer write and route computation we will discuss the next one. So, if I were to draw it I will have my local channel I will have north, south, east, west each physical channel is associated with two of these virtual channels. So, I will have two virtual channels over here and then what I can do is that all the buffer information, signal route information etcetera will be sent to this pipeline lab. So, this will be the end of cycle 1. In cycle 2, I will compute the route and then again in cycle 3, I will do the virtual channel allocation. Again, this is for the head plate. So, the idea over here is that let us say at this point you decide that you need to go east. So, with the physical channel that is going east maybe 2 or 3 or 4 virtual channels are associated. So, let us say 4 virtual channels are associated with it. Which one do I take right the first one, second one, third one or fourth one. So, that would also depend upon what are the channels have allocated to other plates that are other packets in the past right I need to ensure that my virtual channels are also kind of equitably used. So, what I basically do now is that I do this allocation process where uh, given a head flit I based on my you know load balancing algorithm I allocate a virtual channel to it and that is written into the head flit in the buffer queue and then I do subsequent processing. So, let us now go to stage 4 which is the next step. It is the switch allocation step. So, if we look at this diagram once again, we see that there are 4 sorry 5 physical channels as inputs and each channel has uh, 2 of these VCs. So, basically we will have pretty much 10 VCs that want a switch port. So, we will have, so we need a switcher you know, so our switch has to have 10 inputs and 5 outputs and the 5 outputs will be the 5 physical channels, 4 each that are going in 4 directions north, south, east, west and local and then uh, we uh, have uh, you know these 5 outputs north, south, east, west and local. And we have 10 inputs, so 2 uh, virtual channels per physical channel. So, it is 10 cross 5. So, if it is uh, 10 cross 5, we need a switch. So, what does a switch do? A switch connects an input to an output and for a single output, only a single input can be connected. In the sense, 2 inputs cannot be connected to the same output. So, we need an m cross n switch pretty much. Right. So, we need to allocate the switch, we need to make the connections and in a sense it is like we have m inputs, n outputs and here there is a connector that connects an input to an output and naturally for every column, a column corresponds to an output, only one input or one row can be connected and what you have of course, there are multiple bits that go in parallel, but you have these pass transistors where if I set the control bit to 1, essentially a connection is established uh, between these two lines and if it is 0, there is no connection. So, the main aim is that we need to operate a switch, but prior to operating the switch, we need to make these mappings. 
right so then uh, we allocate the switch ports so we which means we reserve a path to the output port so here uh, needless to say fairness is important because it should never be the case that you know plates in one vc are waiting and then they are waiting forever so fairness basically is uh, tantamount to starvation freedom over here right so basically we have to ensure that at this place at this particular point we have starvation freedom so because we have starvation freedom uh, what will happen uh, is that uh, uh, what will basically happen is that uh, all VCs will be guaranteed to get access to the switch and once they get access to, to the switch nothing else is there then they can directly access the physical channel and go. So the buffering is only at the input it is not at the output so these are input buffered systems. Right, so there will be no stalling that happens at the output. So once the fourth stage switch allocation is done, the fifth stage which is switch traversal can happen and that will happen quite quickly and the latency is quite critical here but switch traversal would be just traverse the switch and send the packet. So as I said there are no buffers and there is no waiting, there is no stalling. So once you traverse the switch the packet is sent and then resources can be released in the sense that once the tail slit leaves the router we reclaim the VC, right? So, the VC, the virtual channel is reclaimed. So, uh, before we go into the hierarchical design of switches, I would like to pretty much switch to the next lecture uh, by giving, you know, I would like to summarize by giving an idea of the router pipeline, right? The five stage pipeline that we have discussed up till now. So, let me quickly summarize this and the rest of these details will be covered in the next lecture. So, the router pipeline that we have discussed up till now, the first stage is buffer write. The so buffer write is clearly stage 1. So, here what we have is that for every physical channel, we have multiple virtual channels associated with it. The buffers come and the buffers are uh, sorry, the flits come and the flits are buffered in these VCs and basically when a head flit is coming, it knows its VC number. So, the head flit is aware of its VC number in the sense the previous router has stamped it with its VC number and let us say if it is coming from the local tile, then we have already done the VC allocation and then, it, then only it is coming into the router. So, we are assuming that any head flit and consequently the rest of the flits in its packet, they are already aware which VC they need to go to, they are buffered there. So, here of course, we could have a so, sorry, a split buffer de design or we could have a shared buffer design. So, split buffer is that these buffers are separated into separate structures and shared buffer is where we have a single structure but it is kind of dynamically split between the VCs. And then uh, we have these buffer control signals or route information that is sent to the route computation unit which will be stage 2. Uh, the, then we do VC allocation, virtual channel allocation which is stage 3. So, again the route computation and the virtual channel allocation and switch allocation all of them happen for the head flit because the rest of the flits yeah, follow them. But again you know this is splittable so there is you know, there is more to this let me come to this point. So, once the VCs have been allocated what happens is that uh, we kind of stamp the head flit and tell it that look you have been allocated let us say VC number 2 on you know this physical channel now you go ahead and what we can do is that we can also additionally mark the rest of the flits in the packet but mind you all of them may not have arrived at that point and then we go to the switch allocation stage so here as i said you know there's a little bit of complexity it depends on whether we take decisions at the flit level or we take decisions at the packet level so, if we take decisions at the flit level, then pretty much every single flit will have to contend for switch allocation, which is like, you know, this stage over here. So, here we will basically say that, look, 
uh, you know, the first flit, you allocate this, then you forget about it, then you schedule flits from other VCs, come back to the second flit in the packet, so on and so forth. So that will basically be flit level decision making where every flit is treated independently. But of course, uh, you know, uh, the only caveat here is that body and tail flits follow the same route as the head flit. But again, as I said, it's possible that we send a head flit after a long time, we send a body flit again and after a long time, we send the next body flit, so on and so forth. The other would be that we send the entire packet together, assuming all of it has arrived. So that would be if we go for packet level buffering, where you know the entire packet is sent in one go. Then the switch allocation has to be done once for the entire packet, but that is kind of rare. If you just go by flit level, every single flit will have to contend separately. Then we have this switch over here, which as I have discussed, has 10 inputs and it has 5 outputs. So basically the allocation decision was already made in stage 4. So the last stage is nothing, it's quite dumb actually, it's just basically traversing this switch. We traverse this switch and we go away through the output link. Uh, in the output there is absolutely no buffering, no buffering, no waiting, no stalling. So once you are allocated a switch, you just go ahead, that's it. No, no one is there to stop you. So then you just go and Basically, you know, we'll also have this flow control module over here, right, which is taking care of credits or on a flow control. The idea is that you have sufficient credit. So this credit information is also kind of flowing into the switch allocator over here. That if you don't have enough credits, there's no point allocating the switch because, you know, you can't send the packet or the flit anyway. But the key point is that once we have credits, you know, you are sure and you are sending, so you are sure that the data will be buffered at the other end, right? The flit data will be buffered at the other end. That much you are sure of. So that's the reason you can sort of fearlessly send the flits and you, will sh and you are sure that they will not be dropped or discarded. So this is a five stage router pipeline. And if you think about it, five stages, you know, can take five cycles that makes things reasonably slow, not a great idea, but again, we will look at ways of optimizing this and making these things faster in the next lecture. Of course, also look at other aspects, but this is uh, the, this lecture ends over here with the description of this five stage router pipeline. Mm -hmm.